having heard God's word and confessed our sins and again reminding ourselves of the forgiveness and the full salvation that we have in him. Now let's turn our attention to God's word. Someone asked me this morning, uh, are we still in Mark? Um, Which is a very great question. Um, For those of y'all who have been with us the last several months, we've been preaching our way verse by verse through the gospel of Mark. And last week we finished the sermon in Mark chapter 16, verse 8. And several times in the course of the sermon, I I made the comment that this would be our last series in the Gospel of Mark, which is curious. Since if you open your Bibles, and if you have a copy of the Bible, I would invite you now either to open it up or to turn it on to Mark. Um, Well, let me retract that. If you were to know in the back of the book of Mark, there's a few extra verses. We'll get there. But first, if you have a copy of the Bible, let me invite you first to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. And follow along with me as I read the first four verses. Listen very carefully. Because this is the word of God. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Y'all, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you might already be able to tell based on what I've already said, I have never preached a sermon like this sermon. And it's quite possible that I will never preach another one quite like this morning's sermon. What do I mean by that? And in the passage we just read, Paul tells Christians that there is such a thing as what C.S. Lewis calls mere Christianity. Christianity is complex because it's true, and it's true in the real world, but it can be boiled down to something very simple. Trust that Jesus is who he says he is. The, The chosen mediator between God and humanity. The eternal God himself who added a human nature to his divine nature in order to save us from sin and evil and death. He is the substitute who stepped in to take our punishment, who truly died before God truly raised him from the dead. He is the only Savior that all people must follow in order to be rescued from the judgment to come. And all of that is, according to Paul in verse 4, in accordance with the Scriptures. So we really can say Christianity is simply everything the Bible says. That's basic, non-negotiable Christianity, not only in our church and our denomination, but with our brothers and sisters around Effingham and Chatham and beyond. That's what Christianity is. It's everything the Bible says. But the ending of the Gospel of Mark, forces us as Jesus' people to ask this question, why should we trust the Bible? We really do need an answer to that because again, following the last verse that we looked at last week, Mark 16, 8, modern Bibles include 12 more verses and almost certainly with some kind of note attached. So for example, if you're using this edition of the Bible, which we give away for free at the free resource table, if you are using this edition of the Bible, the English Standard Version says this immediately before Mark 16, 9. Some of the earliest manuscripts do not include 16, 9 through 20. What does that mean? And how should we respond to the suggestion It seems like it's suggesting that something in our Bibles doesn't belong there. How do we as people who love God's word, who believe that it is perfect, 
that is for us and for our salvation, how do we grapple with that note that is in almost, almost all of our modern editions of the Bible? This morning, we'll answer that to some extent. We'll see four points that help us to see one really simple charge. Here's the sermon in a sentence. Trust the Bible as the Word of God. Know that it is the Word of God, but but more than just know in your heads, brothers and sisters and friends, trust it with your hearts. That the more we understand about the Bible, the more we understand its beauty and its complexity and its truth, the better we can trust it as the true message of a loving God, and and the more we can build our whole lives on what he tells us. Let's dive in with this first point. It's going to lay a foundation to understanding the Gospel of Mark. We really will get there. But first, let me invite you to turn instead to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we'll see this very simple point. God wrote the Bible. God wrote the Bible. In 2 Timothy 3, starting in verse 16, Paul again says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Well, let's start here. What, what is the Bible? I, I just don't want to presume anyone in here, no matter how old you are. You, you may be visiting this morning and you have never encountered the Bible. You may be someone who has followed Jesus for a very long time, but you never really asked that question. What, what is the Bible? Well, let's start here. The answer that anybody could give, whether you're a Christian or not, um, might go something like this. The Bible is a collection of 66 books. And it tells the story of how first the people of Israel and eventually the Christian church have understood God and ourselves and life, all of life. The Bible is made up of history and poems, letters and prayers and laws and all other kinds of writings that first Jews and later Christians have published together in one volume, believing that it tells one main story. This is the main story of the Bible, how God made everything and how humanity broke everything and how God in the person and in the work of Jesus is fixing everything and how one day everything will be restored and reconciled to God again. That's the the big story of the whole Bible. You could know that about the Bible without believing the Bible. But it's telling that story. But we can recognize that's accurate enough, but, but it doesn't include something very important. That answer I just gave. That answer does not include a key piece of information. What does the Bible say about itself? Because when you read it, the Bible does not present itself as a collection of legends or fairy tales. It's not random stuff that people have found inspiring. In other words, the Bible is not like a one-volume edition of the Chronicles of Narnia or the Lord of the Rings. It's, it's not a conveniently bound collection of fictional stories. No, the Bible is not a greatest hits collection from some ancient cultures that for some reason some people in some places like to read sometimes. It's not that. Instead, what does the Bible say about itself? Y- y'all, I-, I am very convinced by this, and I would invite you to consider it yourself, that from first to last, the Bible claims to be the words of the Creator and the one who is sustaining the whole universe. At no point, I can say this with great confidence because I've read the Lord of the Rings a gajillion times, At no point in The Lord of the Rings does J.R.R. Tolkien write something like this. P.S. These words that I'm writing are eternally significant to the real world because I, Professor Tolkien, am the God over all creation. He ain't got that line in there. 
But the Bible has lines like that all over the place, all the time. For example, in the verses we just read, take that passage from 2 Timothy 3, where Paul says in verse 16 that all Scripture, all the writings contained in the Bible, in all of its 66 different books, they're not inspired in the sense that they're very creative or motivating. They are, Paul says in verse 16, breathed out by God himself. So the Bible and every part of the Bible is as from God as possible. It it couldn't be more clear, according to the Bible, that God produced this and gave it to the world. The Bible matters first and foremost, not because we find it interesting or inspiring or personally enlightening. The Bible matters because God himself wrote it. And that is extremely practical for you, whoever you are this morning. So for example, uh, in a minute we'll we'll show on the screen a a long quotation that was written 500 years ago by a group of Christians in Switzerland. It, It was written to explain the connection between God writing the Bible and how we listen to sermons. Follow along with me. These Christians wrote, We believe and confess the canonical scriptures of the holy prophets and apostles of both Testaments to be the true word of God and to have sufficient authority of themselves, not of men. For God himself spoke to the fathers, prophets, apostles, and still speaks to us through the holy scriptures. That's what the Bible is. According to them and according to Christians at all times and in all places, the Holy Scriptures, the Bible is literally the true Word of God. It has authority, not because any particular person says so. It has authority because it comes from God. And on the next slide, we'll see that these Christians make that practical when they say this. These capital letters are original. This is how they wrote it. The preaching of the Word of God is the word of God. Wherefore, when this word of God is now preached in the church by preachers lawfully called, we believe that the very word of God is proclaimed and received by the faithful. And that neither any other word of God is to be invented nor is to be expected from heaven. And that now the word itself which is preached is to be regarded not the minister that preaches. For even if he be a evil and sinful man, nevertheless, the word of God remains still true and good. Friends, whenever someone reads the Bible to us, and whenever they explain and apply the Bible in a way that's true, then, in a very real sense, God himself is speaking audibly to us. And that has got nothing to do with whoever is preaching. It may turn out that the person preaching was a massive hypocrite who actually never believed what they preached. But friends, because God wrote the Bible, because God is the one who gives it to us, then anybody who preaches it accurately, even if they preach it without skill or even without true faith, then at worst, those preachers are like partially clogged pipes. The the water pressure is reduced. Humanly speaking, you can tell a difference. But the water still flows through. And it doesn't get changed into something different because of the pipes. It is still water. Friends, bad preachers might make it hard for us, humanly speaking, to receive what God says in his word. But make no mistake, God himself is speaking even through them. And so let me invite you to ask, especially you who are fellow members with me of One Savior, do you listen to sermons like that? Trusting that God himself is speaking to you and to our congregation in the Bible. Someone tells a story about leaving a church service years ago and hearing someone else say on the way out, well, I didn't feel very worshipful. The person telling the story overheard someone else say to them, 
Like usual, the best theologians of the church are the little old ladies. Well, dear, worship isn't a glandular condition. It's not something that we feel or don't feel. Sometimes we feel big feelings. And sometimes we recognize, I feel about the same as when I came in. But brothers and sisters, if that's you today, desperately hoping that in order to encounter God and experience Him, you must feel something big or worship didn't happen. Brothers and sisters, let God's Word correct your perspective. Because whenever we read the Bible and whenever we pray the Bible and sing the Bible and preach the Bible, our feelings matter. God made us and He made our emotions, but our emotions do not determine whether God is here and at work. Friends, God's Word is all that is required for worship. And our faith and our trust in God's Word is all that it takes for us to receive that. Even if, for whatever reason, it doesn't feel like it in the moment. And all that is because it doesn't depend on us or our emotions. It doesn't depend on whoever is leading any particular part of the service. All of that is true very simply because God wrote the Bible himself. That's our first point, and it's really important to receive that. Because we need to hear a second thing as well. This is all building a foundation for us to understand the ending of the Gospel of Mark. What else do we need to know to understand the final verses of Mark? The second thing, really simply, people wrote the Bible. The first point is that God wrote the Bible, but secondly, people wrote the Bible. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Here, Peter says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased." We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. You recognize, friends, he's referring to the story of Jesus' transfiguration. And he's saying, I was there. It really happened. It's true. We didn't make it up. But keep reading. And, verse 19, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Especially those of us who have the opportunity to have non-Christian family members and friends and co-workers, surely some of y'all have heard one of them say, in as many words, I don't believe the Bible because it's just a book written by men. Surely you've heard someone say that. Maybe, maybe you're here this morning thinking that. Friends, let me invite you to consider the Bible was written by men is not as much of an argument as you might think it is. First off, because that's not a secret. The, the Bible itself makes that very clear in this passage and others. The, the, the question is not whether men spoke, Peter says in verse 21. It's not whether men spoke, it's how they spoke. Peter continues that men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Carried along like a sailboat. Yeah, the the boat moves whoever's on board. But what moves the boat? The wind, something outside of the boat. And in the same way, friends, the writers of the Bible wrote it. Is that not the deepest thing you've heard today? The writers of the Bible wrote it. But who, we have to back up a step and ask the question, who moved them to write what they did? 
Here and elsewhere, the Bible makes it clear that God, specifically, Peter says, God, the Holy Spirit, moved the people to write what they did. And the longer you read the Bible, and and good night, I, I hope you receive this invitation to read the Bible. The more you read the Bible, the more you and I recognize that every book, every writer, has a different style. We've spent the last many months in the Gospel of Mark. Mark does not write like Paul does. And Paul doesn't write like David writes. David definitely does not write like Moses writes. Is that because God hired a really bad copy editor for the Bible who just did a cruddy job smoothing it out? No. No, he inspired each writer to use their own words to write down what they wanted to write, which, under God's movement, under God's inspiration, was also what he wanted them to write. So the Bible was not written by people who heard God whisper something in their ear, wrote that down, and then asked, okay, God, what words come next? That, that's not how the Bible presents itself, usually. Yes, to be clear, some parts of the Bible do say exactly that, that they are directly quoting something God communicated to the writer. And, and in those places, it's very clear. That's what they're writing down. But most of the Bible does not present itself like that. It, here's an illustration that I really love. It, it, was, it was given by a Presbyterian theologian named B.B. Warfield, uh, that the Bible more than anything else, is a lot like a stained glass window. Each piece of glass in the window is impure. Something's been mixed with the sand and with the components of the glass to make it have a particular color. It's an impurity. And each piece of glass is warped and formed in a certain way that light does not pass through it perfectly transparently. The the glass bends and refracts the light as it passes through. But the artist who makes the window already knows each impurity, each unique little bent to each piece of glass. He, He is the one who formed the glass to be that way. He guided the creation of the glass from the moment it came into existence all the way until it was installed together with the other pieces. There is absolutely nothing about the glass that the artist doesn't take into consideration as he or she assembles the final product. And and so the question's not whether the glass has quirks or imperfections or impurities. Each and every one does in some sense. But the question really is, does that window as a whole and in detail reflect whatever the artist wants it to reflect. Whenever the light shines through the window at sunrise, whenever the light comes through at high noon, whenever the windows are lit up by outside floodlights in the middle of the night, whenever the light shines through the window, all the different pieces reflect the light exactly like the artist wants it to. In that sense, the the imperfections and impurities of the stained glass are not flaws. Under the hand of the artist, they're features. They're very intentionally designed that way. They don't detract from the artist's vision. They're part of it. And so, friends, consider that God is like a master artist, a master craftsman, who formed dozens of authors living in very different cultures, speaking several different languages, having incredibly different lives, full of very different experiences. And our God oversaw every detail that led up to them putting pen to parchment. And what they wrote of their own free will was under his sovereign control. Even the parts that don't begin with the phrase, thus says the Lord. All of it is perfect under God's inspiration. Brothers and sisters, God arranged this beautiful window to make the light of his word shine into our world 
in particular ways. This is such good news for us. Not only because without it, we would be living in darkness and fumbling around trying to understand God and ourselves and the world. And now we have light. We have some measure of clarity. And it's delivered in a beautiful way. That light that God has shown into the world through the Bible is bright enough for totally uneducated children to see it and to see what it reveals. But the window, the Bible, is also beautifully complex in a way that invites us, it it demands us to know it well, to study it, to, to, with the church here in Effingham and across time and across cultures, to study God's word together, to say, do you see that? And isn't it beautiful? Some people will go deeper than others in the way they study God's word, but nobody is exempt from having to study and understand the beauty and the complexity of the Bible, which exists because people wrote it, because God chose to write it through people. So let's do what Proverbs 23, 12 says. Apply your heart to instruction and your ear to words of knowledge. You see that word apply? Work at it. Christianity accepts anyone who comes, but it does not bless willful ignorance. Instead, it invites us to know this word that we might know the God who gives it. Friends, work to learn the Bible. Why? Because of what God, through Moses, says in Deuteronomy. First in chapter 8, man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And then several chapters later, still in Deuteronomy, God through Moses says, it is no empty word for you, but your very life. Friends, work to learn it. Work to understand it. You got to. Because people wrote the Bible. What in the world does all that have to do with the end of Mark 16? Both of those two points are like pillars. They're necessary pillars to help us understand this third point. Yes, God wrote the Bible. Yes, people wrote the Bible. And thirdly, some copies of the Bible include mistakes. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 25. The first verse says, These that are about to follow, these also are Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. Y'all Old Testament scholars, you know that Hezekiah, king of Judah, lived many hundreds of years after Solomon. But some parts of the Bible were copied down, and we know that, not from history or not from assumption, but because the Bible itself says some parts were copied. The the original copies of biblical books were perfectly inspired because God wrote them. They were perfectly accurate to what he wanted to communicate, even though people wrote them, because God was writing through them. And as the Bible has continued to cross cultures and to cross time periods, to cross languages, so that more people might hear the good news of Jesus Christ from ancient times, copying books of the Bible was a very serious job. But even so, when you do something a couple billion times, there's some math teachers in the room, I think statistically, when we do something a couple billion times, we're liable to goof it up from time to time. These mistakes that certainly happened, we know they happened, these mistakes are almost always incredibly minor. For example, in, in the study of these ancient copies, do you know what the number one kind of mistake that's made is? Basic spelling errors. It's the kind of stuff that we would do if autocorrect didn't save us. Just, we got the word right, we just spelled it differently. But the second category of differences or mistakes that were made in the copies after basic spelling is simply adding titles to the name of God. 
For example, some copies of the Bible will read the word Jesus. Some copies made from that would add the Lord Jesus or Jesus Christ or the Lord Jesus Christ. You recognize that the basic meaning is not affected even a little bit. But over time, in some very rare and known cases, the mistakes made during the copying process do make a difference. And with that in mind, turn to Mark chapter 16. In Mark chapter 16, after verse 8, which we read last week, my edition of the Bible says some of the earliest manuscripts do not include the next several verses. After that come these verses. Now, when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they wouldn't believe it. After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they didn't believe them. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table. And he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they hadn't believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever doesn't believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues or new languages. They will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it won't hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. The oldest copies of the Gospel of Mark that still exist come from around the year 350. Can you imagine writing a letter to somebody and it's still around 1,700 years later? That's what we have in these ancient copies of Mark. And all of these ancient copies from that long ago stop with verse 8. The verses we just read are just not there. But here's where things get interesting. Many other newer copies of the Gospel of Mark have these extra paragraphs that we just read tacked onto the end. So the first copy of Mark that we have that includes these extra verses was made in the year 450, a hundred years after the next oldest copy. 400 years after Mark wrote the original. But here's the tricky thing. Because that copy, the copy that includes the extra verses, was copied many times over, it became the standard template for copies of the Gospel of Mark. And so in terms of sheer numbers, of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of copies from the first thousand years of the church, of the Gospel of Mark, Most of them do have this longer ending, verses 9 through 20. And one of those copies eventually made its way to England, where in the early 1600s it was used by the translators of the King James Bible. They didn't have access to other copies. They just used, they did what we would have done. They used the copy that they had, the copy that had this longer ending. And since then, since the King James Bible was translated. These other copies, these even older copies, have gotten a lot easier to access. And because of that, we all in this room can understand the differences between all these ancient copies. That's why, for example, today, 
whenever you buy or download an English Bible, it will almost certainly have some kind of note between verses 8 and 9, explaining, like the English Standard Version does, that these extra verses didn't exist in the oldest copies. The only exception to that, the only Bibles that we can buy today that don't have really some kind of note are the King James Bible or the New King James Version. They're, they're still recording what was done 400 years ago by the translators who did an excellent job. I, please don't, don't mishear me. I love the King James. I, I read the King James every week as I prepare to preach. It's a beautiful, well-done thing. It's just that this place in the Bible makes it a little tricky to preach because there's really no other passage of the Bible quite like this. The King James and, and now the New King James Version still record the work that was done from that template copy that included these extra verses. Y'all, let me be clear. I am not trying to give a history lecture, though y'all who know me know that I, I love that. That's cool for me. Uh, some of y'all love and some of y'all hate history. The point of preaching is not to give a history lesson. I'm certainly also not encouraging any of us to be suspicious about your Bible. That would be the opposite of what I'm trying to do. In fact, brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to do in explaining that is to encourage you to trust the Bible that's in your lap or on your phone. We have received so many excellent translations because of the lifetimes of work done by so many faithful people. We can and should trust the Bibles that are given us. But what do we do with the fact that some copies of the Bible in some places, disagree with each other. What do we do with that? Two things. First, I long for everyone in our church to know how to respond when some people tempt you to doubt the Bible. The fact that some copies of the Bible have mistakes does not mean that the Bible has mistakes. It just means that somebody needs to do the work to figure out what the oldest original copies said. If you're a spreadsheet person, I don't understand you, but I'm very appreciative of you because you make the world go round, and I'm terrible at what you're good at. If you're the kind of person who can sort through and do detailed work comparing little notes here and there for hours on end and get up and do it again the next day and then do it for your career, you are the kind of person who's been looking at this problem for centuries. Brothers and sisters, people have been doing this work for such a long time. Did you know that it is easy, I I said this earlier, I want to follow up on it, it is easy for any of us today in this room to learn how the Bible was copied over time. You can look up the ancient manuscripts I'm talking about for free on the internet. And so if you know how to read ancient Greek, you can compare it yourself. There is nothing That's a secret. There is no conspiracy. It's all out in the open for anyone to examine for themselves. In short, internet trolls know just enough to mess with your faith, but not enough to know what they're talking about. And so, in the words of the theologian, Taylor Swift, shake them off. I understand their arguments. I understand where they're coming from, but recognize you are telling me a half-truth. And my God not only wrote a true word and not only passed it through faithfully and perfectly to people, the mistakes in the copies do not affect the reliability of the word in front of me. So, the haters are going to hate, hate, hate. Secondly, don't just know how to respond to them. Notice, I hope you maybe did as we read in these verses, notice there's really nothing in here that contradicts anything else in the rest of the Bible. In in fact, for those of y'all who know the New Testament well, you'll recognize that Mark 16, 9 through 20, is sort of just a Cliff's Note, sped up, fast-forwarded summary of what Matthew and Luke and John say, the other three Gospels. We can imagine, there's no proof of this, but we can imagine someone coming to the end of Mark And like we saw last week, being a little disappointed with the book ending with, and they were afraid. And deciding some readers might want to hear the rest of the story. 
We don't know if that's exactly what happened. But the point is, what they added is really simply a summary of what we know already from the other parts of God's word, with the only possible exception of this part about handling snakes and drinking poison. Y'all, I'm from Appalachia, and that means there are some people I know who are into that kind of thing. I don't think in our context at One Savior Church I need to say that's not what Jesus is saying. I think we could, for the sake of conversation, if we accept that verses 9 through 20 really were written by Mark and they really did come from God and Jesus himself really did say this, no other part of the Bible records it, but if the Lord Jesus really did say this, then we can understand it to be a really vivid, a really powerful, a really accurate metaphor for the protection that God provides his people as they go out into all the creation and preach the gospel. That can be easily explained. There's nothing in these extra verses that change the message of the Bible in the least, and there's nothing in them that should shake our confidence in God's word. And that means, very simply, we as Christians should learn more about these extra verses. But secondly, we should not freak out about them. We should not be shaken in the least. If this is something that interests you more, maybe because you yourself have questions that I haven't answered, or if you have friends who would benefit from this, this morning we have extra copies of a book on the free resource table, uh, an excellent book by Pastor Greg Gilbert. It's a little white book. And it's called Why Trust the Bible. It is very short, but it is very thorough. And if you're more interested, not only in learning yourself, but also if you want to help persuade others to trust the Bible in front of them, I highly recommend it. I wish everyone here could take home a copy and read it. But like always, if you're interested in a free resource, take it if you'll read it and give it away to someone else. There's that spiel. Because there's so much more I could say, and time flies. So I'm going to cut it. But I want, what I want us to do very simply whether you've checked out a long time ago or if you're just now checking back in, this is the point of everything I've been saying to this point. Be confident in your English Bible. Not everyone needs to learn Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek to translate the originals, but some people do. And they have. And their work has produced copies of the Bible in multiple translations that are all faithful and accurate and helpful such that whether you use the English Standard Version like I'm reading from or another one, if you're in this room and you speak English, oh, Espanol, you have an excellent copy of the Bible that you should trust, not only to be reliable, but like we heard in Deuteronomy, to be your very life. There's a whole lot more to say about that. But let me land the plane with one final brief point that's built on everything I've said so far. Yes, God wrote the Bible. Yes, people wrote the Bible. Yes, some copies of the Bible contain mistakes. But lastly and finally, entrust your life to the Bible. This is what God tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 4. What does it mean to entrust your life to the whole Bible? Didn't I just say that, that we should consider it trustworthy and reliable? Isn't that all that that means? Well, look at this. Deuteronomy chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Moses says, Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I'm teaching you and do them, that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor, For the Lord your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal of Peor. If you want more background on that, read the book of Numbers. It's not a good story. It's not good when people abandon God's word. Back into verse 4. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are still alive today. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you're entering to take possession of it. Keep them. Do them. For that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, non-believers, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. 
For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? What great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Only take care and keep your soul diligent lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. So much to be said. But in this passage, God makes something very clear. He does not want us to be confused about where the Bible comes from. And he does not want us to be confused about whether we should bank our whole life on it. The content of the Bible, he says here, came from him. And the content of the Bible came through people. Here, Moses. The content of the Bible needs to be heard, he says here, by more people through us. Yeah, the history of the copying of the Bible, including the reality of copying errors, is not anything that Christians need to be afraid of, not at all. And the point of knowing these things, which Moses makes so clear here, the point of knowing these things is not just to make us more confident about things that matter. It's that, but it's more. It's that we should trust all of the Bible in a way that affects the lives of the people around us. That's exactly what Deuteronomy says here. How how will people realize that we we are people that God comes near to whenever we call on him? How will people realize that, according to this passage? It's when we trust and love and obey the word of this God, the word that makes us a wise and understanding people. Y'all, that's the secret sauce of the Christian life. That's, That's the power. Not that any of us are impressive at all because we are not anything special. But to skip ahead a few chapters to Deuteronomy chapter 7, we are people who are loved by God because, I quote, he chose to set his love on us. That God chooses to love us and he continues to draw near to people who trust in him. Near enough to talk to us in ways that we can understand in ways that can be passed on to other people. Things that govern and bless and encourage and correct and sustain all of our lives. And when we understand what he says, and when we receive it and rest in it as the word of a kind God who loves us and sent his own son, Jesus Christ, for us and for our salvation. Y'all, when that happens, We're not worshiping the Bible, but we are rightly and truly and faithfully and beautifully worshiping the God who gives us the Bible for his glory and for our very great joy and for the welfare of all kinds of people around us. Let me invite the musicians to come forward because we respond to the word of the Bible to the beauty of the Bible, to the God of the Bible, not with shaking our heads and saying, that was good, or I did not like that. We respond to God's word by coming to him. According to his promises, we come to him at this table, which is not magic, which does not add anything to God's word, but according to God's promises, we come to this table expecting to meet with our God here by faith through ordinary bread, through ordinary grape juice. We are people to whom God has come near. We are people that God is with by his undeserved kindness and who strengthens us by faith whenever we hear his word. And if you are someone who has entrusted your life to the message of the Bible, specifically that Jesus Christ came for you to redeem you, to forgive you, and to change you, And if believing that has changed your life so that now you have repented and turned your whole life toward him, continuing to sin and continuing to repent, 
if you have been baptized as a member of Jesus' church. And if you're not a member of One Savior Church, but you are in good standing with your local church, friends, brothers and sisters, this table is for you. If you're here this morning and, and for whatever reason you recognize you are not a Christian, you do not follow Jesus, then let me say you are welcome. We are glad to serve you, to become friends with you, to get to know you, and to serve you better and better. But Jesus himself says this table is not for you, not yet, not until you have believed and repented. But to all who have believed, to all who have entrusted themselves to the God of his word, let me invite you, if you're now able physically, to stand and to sing. And brothers and sisters, to come to Jesus at the table.